Hey guys, this is Tranquil Float with the Anti Scam Token team. Just got a video today covering how to check smart contracts for minting functions, more specifically to be looking out at what you should be aware of for scam potentials with minting functions. So, just going to go through a few examples. Uh, first of all, I just want to show you the basic mint function. So, this is actually from Open Zeppelin. So if you don't know, they basically create, uh, have an audited file, like a large library of uh, contracts you can use for ERC20 tokens and a bunch of other different uh, standards as well on Ethereum. Uh, these guys are great. Uh, they have some great content and a lot of tokens use their libraries um, to have basic functionalities basically. And so functionality a lot of tokens use is the mint function. Uh, so this gives us an idea of what the basic mint function looks like. Um, Open Zeppelin has added their own stuff on like this. Um, so basically, uh, so this is the mint function. It accepts an address and an amount. And the address is where the minted tokens are going to go and the amount is how many tokens you're going to mint. So firstly, it requires that you're not minting to the zero address, which is the burn address. Um, and then it also just does this before token transfer, which is just a kind of like a, a little check that it does. Um, so this is the, the main meat of the code here. The total supply of a token uh, is being added to the amount and the balance of how many tokens this account holds is now equal to whatever it was before, add on however much is being minted. Um, so that's basically the core of the mint function. And now in smart contracts, there's two, basically from what I've seen at least, there's two major ways of uh, getting your tokens minted. So the first one, uh, we will be taking a look at Unitrade. So what I do is I normally, when I get to a contract, I just want to look at the mint function. I just do control F, tap in mint, and I look through what results I get. Um, so this, anything in here um, is basically notes. It's not code that gets actioned upon. Um, and basically anything that's within this asterisk is on these lines is not going to be coded at all. So um, you can just write whatever there. And anything that would be like, go here. So anything like this as well. So this sets out notes for the rest of the line. And this is also notes. Uh, so anyway, so mint. Um, so function mint, so you see they're taking the same, um, basically this is the same code as from Open Zeppelin's mint function. Um, so you just quickly double check that it's the same because obviously if it's not the same, it's something to be concerned about. So it looks all the same to me. So let's see where they use it. Um, so this is in notes, another note one. So this is the new trade contract. I mean, the entire thing is the contract, but this is the specific Unitrade contract that is inheriting from an ERC-20 contract. Uh, and so basically it's got a constructor um, function. And so basically a constructor just runs whatever's in it once upon startup, and that's it. Um, so anything that's inside this curly brackets here will get run once. And so basically you're feeding the function a, a, a number which is initial supply um, and so and that's the um, the name of the token and the ticker so you're saying okay mint to the message sender which is whoever calls this function the initial supply and so this means whoever starts the contract uses this mint function what does that mint function look like it needs the account and the amount. So that's the uh, message sender gets fed into here. The amount of tokens being minted gets fed into here. And you can see the message sender would then have the amount of tokens added to their account. Uh, and so this mint function cannot be used uh, publicly because you can see it's an internal function. That means it can only be called within the contract. If it was public, then you could go to like the, the right contract here and you could connect and then it would pop up here. Um, so a public function is something that anyone can use uh, or at least can access, um, but an internal means they can't. 
Uh, so we'll go to an, another example. So this is DMG token. And uh, so this uses a um, uh, another system using the constructor, uh, which is what Unitrade did as well. So this one, in the constructor, um, you can see they've set the total supply as this number. And then, so the constructor runs, sets the total supply as a number that's predetermined. And then it says the balance of the account, um, which is whatever you feed into the constructor, uh, equals the total supply. So just a quick way to basically transfer this account, whatever the um, number of tokens is. Uh, and so that's how they did it for this one. Uh, you can actually see they have no mint functionality. Um, you know, so you can set it up with your constructor arguments. Um, and basically anything in the constructor just gets executed once. So that's a good way to make sure that people can't keep minting. Um, and so I'll look at Wi-Fi now as an example of a setup that does require a little bit more uh, proof to make sure it is safe. So you can see there's actually a, uh, a public mint function here. So if I go to the right contract, you can see, yep, so we've got add minter, um, move minter, um, and mint. So, you know, what you need to do is basically check, make sure that no one else can use this because it does have some require statements. So we'll, we'll just go through it. Um, so first of all, pay attention here, we've got the constructor argument um, and what's getting executed. So the governance is being awarded to the message sender. Why is governance important? Because with governance, you can then require the message sender as governance. They can then add a minter. And this minter, vol, so you can see they've added um, address minter. Um, and so then they add this address as a, a minter address. And this minter, required here, can then call upon the mint function. So we'll just go check that out quickly. And again, you can see the same logic. It's all standard. It's a standard mint function, so that's okay. The um, internal, so only within the contract. So this public, you know, version of the uh, mint function. Um, basically, what well, this is what needs to happen if you want to make sure that the owner cannot mint anymore. Uh, and I've got an example here from ZZZ. So this is a transaction that has been provided as proof. And how we do it is we go here, and we can see add minter. So we'll decode the input data. So they've added this address as a minter. Um, so, you know, they've set up the contract, they've got governance, and then they've given this address, the minter role. And then what they do is they then mint the tokens and then they remove the same address so that now the minter cannot um, mint anymore, but we still have the issue is that more addresses could get added at a later point, and then they could then mint some tokens. So what ZZZ did is actually set their governance to the burn address. And so this is an address that no one has access to. And so effectively, um, there is no more people that have governance and no more people that can add minters. Um, so that's one way, that's how ZZZ proved that they can't mint any more tokens, any more ZZZ. Um, something else you would want to watch out for is if they added some multiple minters and then they only provided proof for removing one minter. Um, so that would require looking through the um, code a little bit more to check their history, make sure they haven't done anything sneaky there. Um, so that's why a fire system, and that's what it's quite a few systems, quite a few tokens have as a system, uh, of basically setting up roles and minter roles to then mint the tokens and then make sure no one else has those minter roles anymore. Um, and so overall, it is a lot more safer generally to go for the initial supply kind of route of things, um, just because you don't have these roles that uh, could potentially mint more tokens. The only mint time, only time the mint function is called 
is in that initial constructor argument. Um, and I, I just want to put like another little example out here. Um, so this is to Terra. And so if you do a mint search, you get nothing. And you're like, oh, that's really weird. They've actually called it issue here. You can see it's doing the same logic. It requires, you know, don't send it to the burn address or the um, zero address and then adding the balances to the account. Um, so that's just something to also look, and you can see the constructor, they've set it up, uh, and then you issue the tokens to Mesh Sender, the total supply, which is also called, which is also determined here. Um, so basically, that's something to look out for is with all these things, all these smart contracts, you can't just uh, rely on a quick control F and mint. Uh, you have to look for what, basically, what you want to do is you want to look for the constructor argument, the initial one, uh, that's setting the supply and all like that. And you sort of see how, if they said, if they are distributing tokens, how they're doing it. Um, and if they're not distributing tokens in the constructor, you need to see how they're then minting those tokens. Uh, and then making sure they've provided proof that they you know, don't have any more minters. So I think I'll leave it for there, guys. Uh, I do plan to do a another series of videos, uh, basically trying to build up people's smart contract analysis knowledge, just give people a better understanding of how to check the contracts themselves so that they can avoid falling prey to scams like the mint and dump scam, which is a classic and one that we should try to avoid. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks for listening, guys. Um, take care and stay safe.